and my dear brothers and sisters. On the subject of the crucifixion, the Muslim is told in no uncertain terms in the Holy Quran, the last and final revelation of God. He is told in chapter 4, verse 157. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ That they didn't kill him and they did not crucify him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ But it was made to appear to them so that is what they thought they had done, the Jews. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَقٍ مِّنْهُمْ And those who dispute therein are full of doubts. They have no certain knowledge. They're only following conjecture, guesswork, fiction. For of a surety, they killed him not. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, could anyone have been more explicit, more dogmatic? more uncompromising in rejecting the dogma of a faith than this? The answer is impossible. The only one who could afford to do such thing would be the almighty, omnipotent, omniscient Lord of the universe. He is the only one who is entitled to speak in such terms. They only follow conjecture. Guess what? Fiction. The Muslim believes in this authoritative statement of the Holy Quran as of God from Allah Bari Ta'ala Himself. Hence, he asks no questions and he seeks for no proof. He says, My Lord saith, This is what my Lord says, Amanna Saddakna. We hear and we affirm. To this Muslim attitude, the Christian retorts that we do not accept your book, the Holy Quran, as of God, and as such it holds no authority for us. And they further reason that how can a man a thousand miles away from the scene of the happenings of the alleged crucifixion and 600 years away in time tell us what happened in Jerusalem some 600 years before. We say that this is from God, the omnipotent, omniscient, the all-knowing. He knows and he has revealed this knowledge to his messenger Muhammad. The Christian says, had we believed in these statements, of the Quran as of God then there would have been no problem we would all have been Muslims and that is actually what would have happened if they believe that this is Allah's Kalam they would be all Muslims they say further claim that we have written records in our scriptures of eyewitnesses and your witnesses to the happenings in the Gospels of Matthew Mark Luke and John Now, if the Christian reacts against the Muslim attitude, if he reacts strongly, we can understand. Because his salvation depends upon this belief. To him, this is the most important thing of his religion. As Saint Paul, the self-appointed 13th apostle, the self-appointed 13th apostle of Jesus Christ, as he claims in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 14, he says, If Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. In other words, you got nothing. He's telling his Christian, fellow Christians, he said, look, if this had not happened, Christ coming back from the dead, then all of Christianity is worthless, worthless. 
The Americans would say garbage. It's all garbage. Nothing. You haven't got a thing. The only thing you have is, is telling, Paul is telling the Christians, is the death and resurrection of Jesus. If that is not there, you haven't got a thing to tell anybody else. And you know the truth of this statement. Because no Christian comes and tells us that we will teach you hygiene. I'm talking about personal hygiene. We are the most hygienic people. No Christian will come and tell you that we will teach you hospitality. We are the most hospitable people. No Christian can come and tell you that we will teach you ethics or morality. Though we have our little shortcomings, but in South Africa we can boast that the Muslim, he has the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. He has the lowest gambling rate in the country. He has the lowest prison rate in the country. He has the lowest suicide rate in the country. He has the lowest divorce rate in the country. And he has the highest charity rate in the country. There is not another religious group in this country who can show a candle to us that we are better than you. There isn't. The only thing the Christian can tell us is that you have no salvation. There is no Jannah for you. There is no heaven for you. Because all your good deeds, he says, are like filthy rags, rubbish. All your good deeds, your Salat, your Zakat, your Hajj, your Saum, all these are like filthy rags. And he quotes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 6. Filthy rags. They count for nothing. Salvation only comes through the blood of the Lord Jesus. Now the title of this evening's talk, as well as the booklet on the subject that has been given to you, crucifixion or crucifixion. See, while one utters the words, it's hard for you to catch the joke between fiction, F-I-X-I-U-N, crucifixion, and F-I-C-T-I-U-N, fiction. You see, it sounds the same. When the speaker is speaking, crucifixion or crucifixion. You see, what is it? It is repeating the same word. How can it be? Or this. But when you see it in front of your eyes and you see, this fiction is something else from the F-I-X-I-U-N, fiction. The title might seem to some of our brethren somewhat a little provocative. But let me assure you, my brethren, that these words are borrowed words. I have borrowed it from the Christian's own toolbox. These are not my words. I didn't create them. You see, the American Christians, the hot gospelers, the Bible thumpers, the crusaders, fellows like Garner Ted Armstrong, the executive vice president of the Plain Truth, a magazine, which is boasting today six million copies a month, free distribution, six million a month. This Garner Ted Armstrong, he attempts to answer his own puzzle under the heading, was the resurrection a hoax? Hoax. Not my words, his words. Is it a hoax? He's asking the question. Is it a hoax? And he elucidates his poser, hoax, with the words. The resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth is either the supreme fact of history or a flagrant, deliberate fabrication. The strong words. Not my words. This is how the Americans talk. These are flagrant, deliberate fabrication. Another budding young Billy Graham from America a certain Josh McDowell of the Campus Crusade, he effuses in his book, The Resurrection Factor, saying, I was forced to the conclusion, that is after 1,000 hours of specialized study on the subject of crucifixion, he said, I was forced to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is either, again, they always keep on using the word either. The first fellow said either, this or that, either. One of the most wicked, heartless, wishes hoaxes. Look, not my words. These are not my words. This is how they talk, the Americans. This high-pressure religious salesmanship. Superlatives of the highest order. They know how to use them. He says, since it is not possible, I say, for an Oriental like me, an Eastern like me, to emulate the superlatives of our Western brethren, 
we have to borrow the words and we use them in meetings, titles like this. We just had a meeting in, uh, in December last year, a debate between myself and a member of the Church of Christ. Great debate, Christ crucified, hoax or history. They are the words, hoax or history. And we went on to prove that it was a hoax. Last month, that is March 84, this same plain truth, the father of Ted Garner Armstrong, his, his father, Herbert Armstrong, he says, the resurrection, fact or fable. We are, these are not our titles. We don't use words like that. It is they say, is it a fact or is it a fable? I say fact or fiction. Am I going too far out? He says, he's asking the question, fact or fable? So I said, look, instead of fable, I said, fact or fiction? That is all. So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, do you sense any tenseness or electrification in the atmosphere? People seem to be too tight. You know, I can see my brothers and sisters a bit too tight, you know, as if they are... They are spellbound, uh, mesmerized. I want you to relax a little, please. And please relax. And uh, to do that, look, if I may sidetrack a little, I have the 20 rand, did you give it to me? You forgot. I had an idea. You haven't got it. What have you got with you? Now give it to me. <laughs> give it to me. I want to make you people feel a little e at ease. Oh. I want to offer this 20 rands to anybody here. Anybody who can give me the source of this quotation, this statement I'm going to make now, <laughs> whether it was Moses, the Holy Prophet Moses, Marx, Karl Marx, or Muhammad, who uttered these words? Relax, relax. <laughs> I'm quoting. For those my enemies, who would not that I should reign over them, rule them, bring them hither, bring them here, and slay them before me, kill them in front of my eyes. The first person who gives me the author of that statement gets this. Moses, Marx, or Muhammad? Put up your hand, put up your hand. Come on, put up your hand. 20 rands. Anybody? Moses, Marx, or Muhammad? Come on, come on, please, man. Look. These 20 rands are going. I don't want to put them back in my pocket. They're itching. My Christian brethren. Yes. Uh, the brother wants me to repeat it. I said, this quotation, where does it originate? I was asking, Moses, Marx, or Muhammad? The quotation is, for those my enemies, you know my enemies, my enemies, who would not that I should reign, rule them. I want to rule them. I want to rule you all. I want to be the king, dictator of you all. And if you don't want that, I'm telling my followers here, my disciples, say, look, bring them here and kill them. Slay them before me. Who said that? Moses, Marx or Muhammad? Who said that? Come on, come on, one more, one more try. You can help them. Jesus Christ. See, people don't know their own Bible. Luke chapter 19, verse 27. Jesus Christ said, for those my enemies, who would know that I should reign them, rule them, bring them here in front of me and kill them, slay them before me. Jesus Christ. Did you say Jesus? Did anybody hear him say Jesus? Sally? Sally? That brother. 
Are you a Christian? He has. He knows his Bible. He deserves 20 rats. Give it to him. Those gents at the back on that side, could you please reserve that row for the ladies? You can join us on the stage, please. Right, I think it's a little better now. <laughs> you agree with me? We are a little more relaxed now. Me too. See, those 20 runs were itching. <laughs> this was Jesus Christ on his way to the triumphant royal entry of Jerusalem that Easter weekend when he's supposed to have been crucified. He's marching on to Jerusalem and this is the statement he's making on the way. And on the way his followers, people, they're flocking around him and they're marching with him and they're saying the kingdom of God will be established any minute riding a donkey to fulfill prophecy Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 he said tell ye the daughters of Zion behold thy king cometh your king is coming sitting upon an ass mean a donkey and a great multitude spread their garments and branches in the way and the multitude cried saying Hosanna to the son of David and hooray hooray to the son of David Hosanna to the king of Israel Hosanna in the highest hooray 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 Matthew chapter 27 verses 5 and 9 and the beloved physician Luke he says because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear Luke chapter 19 verse 11 immediately they were, there was a turmoil in the air there was electrification in the air Jesus Christ was marching on to Jerusalem to the temple of Jerusalem and they were making a big noise they were throwing flowers in his way they were throwing palm leaf Palm lives in his way. Hosanna, hooray! Hosanna, hooray! And the priests, the Jewish priests, they pleaded with Jesus. He said, look, subdue your disciples. Subdue them. You know, things might go out of hand. The Romans are ruling us. Any minute they can find an excuse for killing us, our people. Subdue them. So Jesus says, if these were to be quietened, he said, even the stones will cry. You can't subdue these people. Can't you see the spirit? If they are subdued, the stones will cry out. And he marches in, into the temple. And he upsets the money changers' tables. He takes a whip and he starts whipping the people. He says, you're making the house of God into a den of thieves. Shh. The kingdom of God was almost to be established. But the whole thing went off like a damp squib. Failed. All the Hosannas, worthless. All the Hurrays, useless. Now, you see, there is a reward for success. Similarly, there is a price you have to pay for failure. The kingdom of God, the rule of God Almighty on earth was to be established any minute, immediately. And the priest started crying. He said, the whole, the, all the people are going mad after him. Them squip. The thing was a failure. It didn't work. So now we reach that upper room in Jerusalem where they're supposed to have had the last supper. While having the supper, he knew that this guy Judas Iscariot was in league with the temple authorities. He was going to betray. So Jesus tells him, go and get going with, do what you have planned to do. Get it over with. And he tells his disciples, he says, you remember previously, I sent you out on your mission of preaching and healing. And when I sent you, I told you, when I sent you without purse, no extra purse, and script and shoes, lacked you anything? Did you lack anything? They says, no. They said nothing. Then said he unto them, but now, but now, he that had no purse, let him take it. And likewise his bag. And he that had no sword, sword, the one to cut people's throats, chop off people's necks. Sword, 
S W O R D sword. Those who have no sword, let him sell his garments and buy one. Luke chapter 22, verses 35 and 36. Preparation. Can you see? Preparation for war, for defense. That march had failed. And now trouble is brewing. In that upper room, there will be sitting targets. Sitting targets for the Jews. So he takes his disciples in the middle of the night, midnight. And he walks them five miles out of town to a place called Gethsemane. An olive press, a courtyard, stone walls. And he puts eight of his devoted disciples. These disciples who were beating their breast in that upper room. He said, Master, anything happens to you, we are prepared to die for you. Master, we are prepared to go to prison for you. Determined lot. Armed to the capacity what the, the circumstances would allow. Armed to the teeth. And he puts eight of his devoted disciples at the gate. He says, he says, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. I, alone, I'll go and pray beyond. Sit, you sit here at the gate. Watch with me. I said, watch what? What is there to watch in the middle of the night in Gethsemane, Olive Press? There's nothing there to watch. No, keep guard because the Jews were after his blood. They'll be coming for him. So you keep guard here. Eight at the gate. And he takes with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Peter the rock. And the two sons of Zebedee described as sons of thunder in the book, in the Bible. And he makes an inner line of defense. He says, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Then saith he unto them, Tarry ye here and watch with me. Matthew chapter 26, verses 37 and 38. And he goes a little further and prays to God for help. And he goes a little further and falls on his face and prays to God. He said, Oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. As a good Muslim, he submits his will to the will of God. If you want me to die, I don't mind, but oh my Lord, save me. And being in an agony, we are told by Luke chapter 22 verse 44, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was, his sweat was as if it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. A man of God, a true man of God, a righteous servant of God, crying with such agony. You think the God of mercy wouldn't hearken to his prayer? When he said that you ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So whosoever asketh receiveth. And he that knocketh shall be opened unto him. He said, which man is there of you? That if his son will ask for bread, he will give him a stone. Or if he ask for fish, he will give him a snake. Is there? The father in heaven. The loving father in heaven. Would he do that? No. James. One of the fourth brother of Jesus Christ according to the Christians. James chapter 5 verse 16. He says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It carries weight. Some cynic remark that if you cry out like that, even the Lord of mercy, the Father in heaven, will come down from his throne to answer your call. You cry like that, bring him down from his throne. He must come to your aid. And God accepted his prayers. He says, who in the days of his flesh, means while he was here with us, he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. He was heard, means God heard his prayers. What does it mean God heard? Does it mean God is deaf at any time? He's all hearing God. He hears everything. He hears the whispers. There were secret thoughts he hears. What does it mean God heard? It means God accepted. Zechariah in his old age he prayed for a son. And God heard his prayers. And John the Baptist, Yahya was born. 
Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam in his old age prayed for his son and Allah heard his prayers and Ishmael was born. Ishmael, Ismail. You know what is Ismael? Means God heard. Literally it means in Hebrew God heard. What? The prayer of Abraham materialized. Ishmael in Hebrew means God heard. The prayer of Abraham. So, God Almighty answers his prayer. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Luke chapter 22, verse 43. The angel came and strengthened him in the hope, the assurance that God Almighty will come to his rescue. But strange as it may sound, the turmoil that Jesus Christ is going through, the preparation he had made, Eight at the gate in a line of defense when he offers heart pourings to God and when he returns the guys are going to sleep his disciples are going to sleep can you imagine the people who are prepared to give their life for him go to prison for him they're going to sleep so Jesus says what could you not wash with me for one hour <laughs> one hour Matthew chapter 26 verse 40 you can't wait with me watch with me for one hour I put you on guard. You know, if they were in the South African army, they would have been caught martial shot, a whole lot of them. Your master's life is in danger. The man is crying, sweating blood. And you go to sleep. <laughs> and he goes and prays again. And he returns. They want to sleep again. And again. <laughs> they want to know. Jesus says, now a friend Mark tells us, 1440, Mark says they couldn't explain. The disciples couldn't explain why they were behaving like that. Neither knew they what to answer him. They didn't know what to answer him. What's wrong with you people? What is happening to you? My life is in danger. And you're going to sleep again and again. <laughs> so Mark says neither knew they what to answer him. What could they answer? What excuse could they give? And Luke 22 45 it says and when he Jesus rose from prayer and was come to his disciples now Luke is a physician a doctor a medical man of his time Luke he was not one of the twelve but he is now giving an excuse what was happening as a physician we must listen to him he says and when he Jesus rose from prayer and was come to his disciples and he found them sleeping for sorrow for sorrow that's a queer explanation by God I tell you you ask any medical man anybody knows anything about medicine anything about physiology about human body you go and ask him can you sleep for sorrow anybody can you sleep for sorrow when your father is dying somebody says I'm coming to burn your house burn your father and mother down and you sleep for sorrow can you sleep for sorrow nature Allah Baritala, the Creator, has given to us, every human being, that internal self-injecting hormone, adrenal, the adrenal gland. It secretes into the body a hormone you can't sleep. Under trial, tribulation, turmoil, you can't sleep. Ask any lady, any woman. Her child is sick and she goes to sleep in sorrow. Her husband is dying and she sleeps in sorrow. Or the man can sleep in sorrow when his wife is dying. You sleep for sorrow. When the life of your hero, your master is in danger, you sleep for sorrow. No, no. Poor Luke, he didn't know anything about medicine. What we know today. Had he known, he wouldn't have put that thing in. You see, the disciples of Jesus, that they had everything on the house. You know, it means everything free. In that upper room, free food and free wine. When you eat too much and you drink too much, this is what happens. There is no other reason. You can't sleep for sorrow. You can't sleep for fear. The only time you can go to sleep when you are at your post in the army. If you have been eating too much and drinking too much, never mind what is happening around you. The bombs are falling. You can still go off. This is what had happened. They go to sleep. So when the Jews came with the Roman soldiers, they found them napping. 
fadab, napping, sleeping. Literally. The Englishmen say, with their pants down. They were caught with their pants down. The disciples, they were snoring away. And these guys with the Roman soldiers, they just tumbled over them and they go into the garden and they want to apprehend Jesus. So, in the inner line of defense, Christ was very close to them, crying, wailing, talking to God. So they couldn't sleep. So one of them said, Master, Master, shall we smite them with the sword? So they had sword. We is more than one. They had swords. Where did they get them from? Jesus told them, you remember? Arm yourself. They were armed. What for? To defend themselves against the Jews. But the Jews were cleverer than what he thought. Look, after all, he's a human being. And they planned and you planned, but the best of plan is God. Jesus planned and the Jews planned. In this case, the Jews' plan was better than his. They came with Roman soldiers. And untrained disciples, no matter what spirit you have, you know, overeaten, drunk, and now comes along, you know, the Roman soldiers, trained men, and you're going to start putting up a fight. Peter did. He slashed the ear of one of the guards, and Jesus said, put down your sword. Now he said, put again the sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Matthew chapter 26 verse 52. Didn't he know that before? That who take up the sword shall perish by the sword? Didn't he know? Why did he tell them the arm? Why the change now? It's natural. Natural. Once you get caught out, the good general, he throws in the towel. The British. In Singapore against the Japanese, 85,000 British they threw down the sword, the guns. 85,000. The biggest surrender in the history of the British Empire. 85,000. They surrendered to the Japanese. 85,000. Can you imagine 85,000 soldiers with all the arms and ammunition they surrender like women? No, no. Don't call them so. The wearer knows where the shoe pinches. The general knows. Better luck next time. Put down the sword. Quarter million British, they fled at from Dunkirk. You remember? Quarter million. Can you imagine quarter million? We can't. You have to see them. Quarter million. Are they all women? No, no. no. Better luck next time. 30,000 Egyptians in 1973, they were surrounded by the Jews. Look, this happens. Again, in Tobruk, 100,000 Allied soldiers had to flee for their life. This man is a great thinker. He can see that now he's cornered. And if his disciples put up any resistance, each and every one would be wiped out. So, he says, now look, put down your sword. Because now he, he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. As the situation changes, he was telling them to turn the other cheek. He was telling them, forgive 70 times 7. Then he says, now arm yourself. And you find that it didn't work, he said, now put down your sword. This is sensible man, sensible general, sensible officer doing the job. the Jews capture him and they take him before the Sanhedrin the learned men of the Jews and they bring false witnesses against him one after another and they can't tell you in their evidence why because it's all false they're making false charges against this messenger of God and that fast it's a fast it's not a trial it's a fast it's a joke so Jesus Christ couldn't tolerate it anymore so he says He says, I speak openly to the world. No secret doctrines with him. Openly to the world. I ever thought in the temple and in the synagogue, whither the Jews always gather, in, in secret have I said nothing that you can implicate me. Nothing. I'll never preach anything in secret which I was not prepared to preach in public. In that case, you would have had hundreds of witnesses to testify against me. But you're getting witnesses and they're all false. They can't even tell it in the concocted evidence. The argument that Jesus was putting forth was so potent. That what are you trying to do? So the officer who was standing by slapped him in the face. Shut him up. What they call the third degree. You know the third degree? Biko had it. Biko. Our Imam had it. Imam Abdullah Harun, third degree, you call it the third degree. You hit the fellow and hit the fellow till the poor man gives up. Third degree, so they slapped him in the face. Did that silence him? 
Ask our Christian brethren, did that silence him? No, no. He says, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? What are you hitting me for? Remember that. How he spoke back, defended himself against the Sanhedrin. That you people are concocting things, and this is very unfair, unjust, and now you, you're trying to apply the third degree, hitting me to silence me. What's wrong with you? Is this, is this Jewish law, or any law, any sane law, civilized law, doing things like that? But they were intent on doing away with the man, because they had decided even beforehand that it was expedient that one man die for the nation. This man, young man, very enthusiastic, he's got a big following. He can create turmoil in the, in the community. And in that case, there will be an insurrection and the Romans will come back with a clamping down upon us and kill our Jews. Rather, we kill this one fellow and save the nation. So it is expedient, not right or wrong. It is expedient that one man die for the nation. They had already decided upon that. Hook or by crook. So they said, are thou the Christ? The son of the living God? And he was the Christ. He was the Messiah. Son of the living God, it was a very innocent Jewish expression. God has got sons by the tons in the Bible. At question time, you may ask me and I'll give them to you. Like that. Sons by the tons. T-O-N-S, tons. In the Bible. So he says, yes. So they says, now his blasphemy is made kufar. What need of we for any further evidence? And he starts tearing his clothes. This is to demonstrate that, look, he's made kufar. Blasphemy. Kill him. But they had no power, they say. So they take him to the Roman governor next morning. When they take him there, they change the charge. You see, they said, look, this guy. To them, I mean, internally, they said, look, this guy's blaspheming, making kufar. For that, he deserves death. He is Christ, meaning God. Son of God, meaning God. Which meant nothing like that. In the language, it didn't mean that. But if you are looking for trouble, this is, you don't have to go very far. In any innocent expression, you can find false. And they found that. It's right. But now they can't kill him. So they take him to Pilate, the Roman governor. And they can't tell him this man has made kufar. Blasphemy. Because to him it's joke. He had his man gods beyond counting. So another man god of the Jews, so what? So they said, no. He's claiming to be Christ, a king. Now they would change the word Christ to mean a king. To them, it's a Christ means a God. It's Kufar. Now to Pilate, this is, he's claiming to be Christ, a king. So Pontius Pilate questions Jesus. He says, are thou the king of the Jews? Are you? Are you the king? He says, thou sayest. That's what you say. I didn't make any such claims. And when he's pressed further, he says, May Koni Kreik is ni van herdi verald ni. My kingdom is not of this world. May Koni Kreik is needy, hear the world knee. In other words, mine is a spiritual kingdom. So to Pilate, he said, look, the guy may be mad. He's not right in his head. But he's not a danger to the state. So he comes forward and says, I find no fault in the man at all. He's innocent of what you people are charging him. He's an innocent man. So they say, if you let this man go, you are not a friend of Caesar. In other words, we will complain to Rome. Said so you allow people like this to carry on, and one day if he creates trouble, he said, look, you were warned. So Pilate is blackmailed into giving in to the Jews. But in his heart and mind, the man is innocent. He said, I find no fault in the man at all. His wife had seen a dream says the scripture, in which he, she was told that no harm should come to this just man. She had sent a message to her husband and said, look, don't do anything wrong with this man. He's a good man. On account of him, I had so many things happening to me. See to it. Pilate says he's innocent. But what is he to do? He's weak. Jesus said that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Human beings are like that. We know where the right is, but sometimes we give in. So Pilate gave in. Now, our learned Christian brethren, the preachers, they tell us that Jesus was led to the slaughter like a lamb, like a sheep before the shearer is dumb. He opened not his mouth. He had said, Mondani uap hamakni. He had said, Mondani uap hamakni. 
he opened not his mouth he opened not his mouth I'm asking how did he speak ask them when they tell you he didn't open his mouth he was led like a sheep before his shearer is dumb like a lamb he's going to a fellow and they slaughtered him and he didn't open his mouth ask them how did he say I have, if I have spoken evil bear witness of the evil but if well why smitest thou me how did the words come out from his head where did the words come from he didn't open his mouth is the mouth shut was he a ventriloquist you know ventriloquist Charlie McCarthy and his doll you know he makes the doll to says but he's uttering voice from his throat and we think is that doll is talking ventriloquism look we believe that he gave life to the dead Jesus Christ by God's permission he healed the blind and the lepers by God's permission but I'm not prepared to believe that he was a ventriloquist he was throwing his voice from underneath and you know with his mouth closed and he was making people to think that they hearing voices coming from other way other side he said and he opened not his mouth before Pontius Pilate he said my kingdom is not of this world where did the words come from he said he opened not his mouth you know amazing thing this born again Christians a fellow a lawyer by profession he writes a book born again he's born again and he's a lawyer he writes a book in which he says I'm quoting he says Isaiah predicts about Jesus Christ one he quotes he would not defend himself at his trial he would not defend himself at his trial and in bracket Jesus did not in inverted commas he opened not his mouth these are lawyers trained lawyers professional lawyers born again Christians with the spirit in them and they, they write these things he opened not his mouth I says please tell us how did he speak how do people how did he say after this word before God is crying so oh my father if it be possible let this cup pass away from me did he utter those words trial and tribulation before Sanhedrin did he speak he did why did the guy slap him because it was very potent defense he was putting up what did Pilate say why did he say I find no fault with the man because he put up a beautiful defense my kingdom is not of this world but you know I don't know how to reason with these people I don't know you'll find very great difficulty with this type of sickness when the guy comes along to your house I tell you it's, it's useless please tell them when you meet the ignorant one you say peace salam then you say to you your religion and to me mine you go your way I go my way sick people you don't talk to sick people but they are all not sick Allah says, testifies in the Quran, among them, the Jews and the Christians, there are good people. Allah says so. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. So there are two different ways of dealing with them. I have given you those booklets. It deals with how to deal with the type who comes along, you know, with a sickness, then you must know how to get the sickness out of him. Otherwise, open the Quran, show it to him. This is what Allah says. This is what Allah says. And it will work. Wallah, it will work. With your tea and your kusistas, with your tea and your samosas, it will work. Change them. This is the destiny of Islam. Allah has given it to us. He says, Li yuzihira huwa lad deena kulli. He's given you a deen to master, overcome and supersede them all. All. Whether it be Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianism, Communism, every ism. Islam is destined to master them all. This is your destiny. Do a little bit of homework. That is all. And I have made these booklets available to you to deal with the sickness. How you deal with it? Look, it's so easy. Once you know it's so easy. The man says he opened not his mouth. Ask him, how did he speak? Was he a ventriloquist? I, as a Muslim, I can't accept that. Ventriloquist, throwing voices. After his alleged crucifixion, it was Sunday morning the first day of the week Mary Magdalene she goes to the tomb alone that's what the Bible says and when she goes to the tomb we are asking why did she go there so the gospel says she went to anoint him so we are asking you see this Hebrew word anoint means is masaha masaha means to rub to massage to anoint so we are asking the Christian 
He says, do juice, massage, dead bodies after three days, do they? Because within three hours, rigor mortis sets in. You know, the hardening of the cells. The body starts fermenting from inside. Such a rotting body, when you massage it, falls to pieces. Does it make sense? After three days, she wants to go and massage the dead rotting body. Do Jews do that? Ask the Jews. They say, no. I say, you Christians, do you massage the dead bodies after three days? The answer is no. We Muslims, we are the closest to the Jew. Do we massage dead bodies after three days? Do you? You Muslims, do you? No. We are closest to the Jew in our ceremonial law. Then why should a Jewess want to go along and wanting to massage a dead rotting body? So she goes there and she's worried about the tomb, tomb, not a grave, tomb. And when she goes there, she finds that the stone is removed. She was worried about the stone, who's going to remove the stone? She's alone. The stone is removed and she looks inside, the winding sheet's inside. So she starts to cry. Now, let us cry for our brothers and sisters at the back for a few seconds, if you don't mind. Uh, there is a crunch there at the back. Mr. Chairman, is there any way you can solve some problem? What is it? There are a few empty seats in front here for the ladies at, who are standing at the back. Could the gents then offer the seats to these ladies if there ain't more? Yes, and there are some gents on that side. That side was reserved for the ladies. There are also seats on the stage for the gents. Please, we, we have stopped now to help you. If Those you people there, please come to the stage. I'm sorry, I'm showing my back to you, my brothers and sisters. Thank you. There are still some men sitting on that side. Please, could you offer those seats to the ladies? Shall we? So the lady starts to cry. It's an anti-climax to what she had expected. Jesus was watching her from wherever he was, not from heaven, but from this earth. You see, this tomb was a privately owned property belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple of Jesus, a very rich, influential Jew who could afford to carve out of a rock a big roomy chamber which according to Jim Bishop, a Christian authority, he says it was five feet wide by seven feet high by 15 feet deep with a ledge of ledges inside. Around that tomb was his vegetable garden. Now don't tell me that this Jew was so generous, he was planting vegetables five miles out of town for other people's sheep and goats to graze upon. I know Jews don't do that. No Christians, no Muslims will do silly things like that. She must have got his gardener's quarters, people to look after his garden, and perhaps his country home where he went during the weekend for his holidays with his family. Jesus is there. He sees this woman. He knows who she is. And he comes up to her. And he says, Fro, warong wienye, we sukye. He says, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? I'm asking, doesn't he know? Why does he ask such a silly question? He knows that she's looking for him. And he knows she's disappointed, she's crying. Why does he ask such a silly question? I said, no, no, it's not a silly question. Actually, he's pulling her leg, metaphorically. He's still got the sense of humor. He says, Fro, warong wienye, we sukye. Say had hadding, the detainer was. She supposing him to be the gardener. I said, why does she suppose he's a gardener? Do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? Do they? That everybody, all of us, when we are resurrected, everybody will look like a gardener. So the wife can't make out her husband. She doesn't know the difference between the husband and the son-in-law. She's confused. And her grandfather and her father, everybody's the same. All gardeners. No. The resurrected body will be you yourself. Everybody will recognize you. You will be the real you. Not this camouflage. This is camouflage. We are exchanging all the time. The real you, the real me, you'll find. You will recognize one another. Inshallah. 
So she supposing him to the gardener, says, Sir Munir, as ye home, where had rahat? If you have taken him hence, say for me, where ye home near Khalehat? Tell me, where have you laid him? To rest, to relax, to recuperate, and excel home, Wechanyam, and ek, ek, alone. Sal home him, not eat a dead rotting body. Wechanyam. That I may take him away. I said, where? What does she want to do with a dead rotting body? After three days, take him home, put him under a bed, pickle him. What does she want to do with a rotting body? I ask you. No, she's not looking for a dead rotten body. She's looking for a live person. She was about the only woman besides Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who had given the final rites to the body of Jesus. She was there. So if she has seen signs of life, she was not going to shout and tell the Jews he is alive, he is alive, because they'll make doubly sure that they kill him. So after three days, she goes there and she wants to handle him, treat him, help him, take him away for treatment. And excel home weaponry. The joke has gone too far. So Jesus says, Mary, the way he said Mary, she recognized that this is Jesus. You know, all of us, we have our unique ways of calling our near ones, our dear ones. We have. I might know your wife's name, but the way you call her and the way I'm going to call that name is not the same. You agree? We have our unique ways, everybody. So he, he says, Mary, the way he said Mary, she recognized Jesus. So she wants to grab him. To do what? To bite him? No, no, no. To pay respects. We Eastern people. His master, her master. So he says, Rak me ni anni, touch me not. I say, why not? Is he a bundle of electricity, a dynamo, that if she touches him, she'll get electrocuted? No. Then I say, why not? I say, because it hurts. You tell me why. For I'm not yet ascended unto my father. I say, is she blind? Can't she see the man is standing there beside her? What does it mean I'm not gone up when he's here? I say, in the language of the Jew, in the idiom of the Jew, he's saying, I'm not dead yet. So, from there we find, he tells her, gives her advice to go and tell his brethren that he is risen. So she goes and tells them, an amazing thing, these disciples of Jesus, amazing, amazing reactions. Mark chapter 16 verse 11. And they, the disciples, and they, the disciples, when they heard that he was alive, that he was alive, A-L-I-V-E, alive, not resurrected. This is the scripture, Mark 16, 11, that he was alive and had been seen by her, by Mary Magdalene. She says, she saw him alive. They believed not. The Bible says they didn't believe. The woman says, look, I saw him, he's alive. He said, they didn't believe it. Why didn't they believe? She's testifying that, look, I met him, I spoke to him, and they didn't believe. Why would they not believe? Because at the back of their minds, this man Jesus was dead. And he's talk, she's talking about a live person. If she had said she's seen the ghost of Jesus, the spook of Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, they would have believed. But she's not talking about spook and ghost and chies. She's talking about the man, he's alive. Because they had, they know, they believe spirits going into pigs. They, it's in the Bible. The spirits went into pigs and 2,000, a herd of them, they ran down the hill and they all got drowned. Spirits going into pigs, they saw. They saw with their own eyes, spirits going into pigs. They saw spirit going into trees and drying them up from the very roots. They saw. They believe anything. But to believe that the living Jesus is alive, that they couldn't believe. If she said, I saw his spook, they would have believed. His spook was all right, but not him. No, they, they, look, I'm only quoting. She, she said, he's alive. And they didn't believe. The disciples wouldn't believe. He's going to Emmaus. On the way to Emmaus, he's got two disciples of his walking side by side. And he's preaching to them about what had happened the previous three days. Five miles they walk, and they still can't recognize the man. I ask you why. He's disguised like Paul Mooney in the good earth. I don't know where he's. Hey, he looks like a real... The king and I, that, what's that, uh, 
you will bring her. You know when these guys, when they take those parts, you think the guy is this, uh, what's this, Indonesian or in, what's this, uh, Indo-Chinese, Siamese, the Siamese king. You believe that when you see the guys on the screen, you believe that the guy is a Siamese king when he's a European and a Jew. You'll burn up. When he acts a uh, part of Pharaoh in the Ten Commandments, you think that he is Pharaoh, he's an Egyptian. No. No, they're so realistic. So Jesus Christ has got such a fantastic disguise. He's talking with his disciples five miles and they don't recognize the man. Why? Because he's disguised, not because he's resurrected. He's disguised. So when they reach a mouse, he makes it that he's going to carry on. So they say, come, come, it's time to eat. Come and join us. So he's persuaded. When he's persuaded, and it came to pass, Luke tells us, chapter 24, verse 30. And it came to pass, as he sat eating, as he sat eating with them, he took bread and blessed it. They said the manner in which he break bread, the eyes were opened. It means, what does it mean? The eyes were opened. It means they recognized the man. It didn't mean they were walking five miles with eyes closed. Look, this is a figure of speech. It means now they recognized the man, the eyes were opened, not that they were walking five miles with closed eyes. The eyes were open. They recognized the man. So when they recognized the man, Jesus vanished. What did he do? The Indian rope trick? You know, going up the rope and vanishing? No, no, no. He vanished means he went away out of sight. So these disciples, they run to their upper room where they had the last supper and they find the others there. There were other eight there. Eight were there. And they go and tell them, say, you know Jesus, he was with us and he sat down to eat. And you know the way he was breaking bread, breaking bread and the way he was blessing it. Like we say, Bismillah. They say, Baruch ata Adonai Elohim malach haulam hamotzi lacham min haaretz. This is the Hebrew way of saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Get started. So the way he said it, they recognized that this is Jesus. So he vanished. He said, man, these guys now are a danger. They might go and tell everybody and I get into trouble. So they run to that upper room, they're telling them, say, Jesus, is, he's there, he was with us. And they say, I can't believe. And they said, we can't believe. And in came Jesus. Some said he stood in the midst. Like that vanishing trick, you know, that these guys in Star Trek, you see in the, your TV sets. You know, the guys, they, they dematerialize and they materialize somewhere and they dematerialize. And you think they did something like that? There's nothing like that. In came Jesus. The door's being shut. That doesn't mean he came in through the keyhole. You know, like this, you see sometimes in films, they show you, you know, the smoke coming out and materializing into a gin. Ginny. No, 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 no. He didn't say he, through the crevice in the wall, he crept through. Nothing of the kind. The doors were shut. This was a mansion. My humble home in, in Verulam, we got four entrances. My humble home. This is the mansion, an upper room. Surely there were other rooms, other ways and means of getting into that house. I don't know how these brothers got there. I don't know how they got there. Look at them. Look. How did they get there? I don't know. But there must be a way. They didn't do materialize and dematerialize from there. There must be a way. I don't know. So in that upper room he goes in and the doors were shut and they're terrified. The disciples were terrified. I'm asking why were they terrified? When you meet your long lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, we Eastern people, we embrace one another, we kiss one another. Why should the disciples of Jesus be terrified? So Luke tells us that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. Luke chapter 24 verse 37. They thought he was a spirit. I'm asking, did he look like a spirit? He said, no. Then I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one? Puzzled. I said, I'll tell you why. You see, the disciples of Jesus, they had heard from hearsay that the master was hanged on the cross. They had heard from hearsay, Sunni Hui Baat, what they had heard, that he was hanged on the cross, that he had given up the ghost, he had died. And now he's dead and buried for three days. A man with such a reputation, you expect him to be stinking in his grave. Such a person, when you see, naturally, you are terrified. See the reason why they are terrified? Because they were not there. 
They were not eyewitnesses or your witness to the happenings. Because Mark chapter 14 verse 50, he says, For all his disciples forsook him and fled. To had almal, to had almal hum farlat and haflach. Almal. I'm asking the Afrikaner, does almal mean almal in your language? Does it mean all? You Englishman, does all mean all in your language? You Zulu, does bonke mean bonke in your language? He said, yes. So they were not there. All the knowledge was from hearsay, what they had heard. So now they are terrified. They think he's a ghost. So Jesus wants to assure them that is not what they are thinking. They are thinking he's a ghost. He's come back from the dead. So he says, Cake na me hand and me footer. Cake, cake. Have a look at my hands and my feet. One that it is itself, that it is I myself. I am the same fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? Fool and me and cake. Handle me and see. Want a chiesa at me flesh and bierna, so as you'll see in that egg at me. For a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. So if I've got flesh and bones, in that case, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. I say, is that what it means in your language, you Englishman? He said, yes. And you Africana? He said, yes. And you Arab? He said, unzuru ila yadaya wa yalaya. He says, behold my hands and my feet. In me, ana huwa, that it is I myself, who suni, one zuru, say, handle me and see. Fa inna ruha laysa lahu lakman wa izamun. For the spirit has no flesh and bones. In any language, every language, it is so simple and straightforward. But how people can be programmed, brainwashed. People can be brainwashed, we too. We must be on guard. People can be brainwashed. They're reading something and seeing something else. They're not seeing what is there. They're reading something in their own mother tongue and then somebody is making them to understand just the opposite of what they're reading. Just exact opposite. Not what is written there, but opposite. He said the spirit has no flesh and bones. They say spirit has flesh and bones. Funny? Jesus said the spirit has no flesh and bones. In other words, he's not resurrected. He's telling them that he's not resurrected because the resurrected bodies get spiritualized. So the clever fellow says, who says so? I said, Jesus. You say, where? I said, Luke chapter 20, verse 36. We were talking about 24, 36. Go back, four chapters, you'll find it there. What Jesus says. So what does he say? I said, you know, the Jews, we're always coming to Jesus with poses and riddles. Want to make a fool of him. Want to make a mockery of him. Now they come to him. They said, master, in the Hebrew language, rabbi, like sheikh, imam. Master, rabbi. Molvi sahib. Maulana says so there was a woman among us, a Jewess, and that woman had seven husbands. Seven husbands she had, according to a Jewish practice. You see, the Jews they had a custom that if one brother died, and if he had no left uh, left no offspring, then the second fellow takes a wife. And when he fails, the third, and when that guy fails, the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, seven guys had this one woman, one after another. But there was no problem. Because it was one by one. Now they want to know from Jesus that at the resurrection, Yawm al Qayyama, when all everybody wakes up same time from Adam to eternity, then seven brothers also waking up same time and they see this woman, they say, May fro. Everybody say, May fro. There's a war in heaven between the brothers. This is mine. The other guy says, This is mine. There's a fight. Seven brothers, because they all had her. They want to have her on the other side. So they want to know which guy is going to have her on the other side. Because they all had her here. This is what the Bible says. They all had her here, so they want to have her on the other side. Which guy is going to have him? Who will be entitled to have her on the other side? In answer to that, Jesus says, Neither shall they die anymore. Once they are resurrected, they will be immortalized. This is a mortal body, which has got its mortal needs, food, shelter, clothing, sex, rest. Without these things, no Indians left, no Africaners left, no Malays left, nothing. That body will be an immortal body. No food, no shelter, no clothing, no sex, no rest. He said, neither shall they die anymore. For they are equal unto the angels. Meaning they will be angelized. They will be spiritualized. They will be spiritual creatures. They will be spirits. For they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. Such are the children of the resurrection. Spirits. He says, when he has had ni flesh and bierna, so as yellow seen that he had ni. A spirit has no flesh and bones. I am not resurrected. Can't you see? Simple, basic knowledge. 
Why does he have to convince anybody that the spirit has no flesh and bones? You don't have to prove it to an atheist, to an agnostic, to a Hindu, to a Jew, anybody, everybody. We believe that the spirit, spirits have no flesh and bones. Because they are thinking he is a spirit. He's come back from the dead. So he's telling, I'm not dead. Can't you see, you fools, what's wrong with you? And they believe not for joy. They are overjoyed and wondered what happened. So he says, have you here any meat, something to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb and he had did khaniyam and fuer hala uwa yet. And he took it and he act in the very sight as if to prove what? That is a ghost, that is a spirit, that is resurrected. Resurrected bodies eat, eat broiled fish and honeycomb, do they? He's proving to you, I'm the same fellow man, what's wrong with you fools? Look, Mary Magdalene says she's, he, was, he was alive. You know, the other disciples, they said, look, he's alive. They said, and they believe not. Now these ten, they tell Thomas, Thomas wasn't there. They said, look, the master was here and he ate with us, broiled fish and honeycomb. He says, I will not believe. What will he not believe? Imagine, this doubting Thomas. He's become famous for doubting. Thomas, this is, was his name. He said, I will not believe. Why won't he believe? Because they're telling him he's a living Jesus. He's alive, not his ghost. He even said, look, we saw the ghost of Jesus. They see them every day. In those days, they're seeing them every day. No, they're not talking about ghost, about spook, about spirits. They're talking about him, himself, the man eating broiled fish and honeycomb. He said, I will not believe. Eight days later, Jesus comes again. Now he sees this guy, Thomas. He says, Thomas, come, come. Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and put your hand into my side and don't be faithless. Now he realizes what a fool he was. So he says, my God, my Lord. So now the Christians say he recognized that Jesus is his God and his Lord. Imagine, you know, you exclaim, <laughs> you go and report me to the special branch that the that was preaching communism here <laughs> to you all, communism. So they come along, give me, harass me, they give me trouble. And they tell me eventually, he says, you know, he says, look, it's your friend, man. Who? Mr. Muhammad. He said, he is the guy who was, you know, prodding us. So when I meet him, his broad smiling face, my benefactor, my friend. I say, Sali, my God, what a thing to do. Sali, my God. He is my God. I say, Sali, Allah, what a thing you have done. Sali, Allah, you Allah. What's wrong with you people? This is an exclamation, what a fool that I was, man. Eh, the, the ten disciples telling that he is alive and I said, I will not believe. What reason did they have to lie? All the ten, he disbelieved them all. Why? Because they were telling that he was alive. Now, you know this crucifixion. It has become a joke by God. It has become a joke. You know, the way they have been trying to tell us about what a thing it was, it is not so serious as people have been preaching all along. In the Philippines, in the footsteps of Jesus, you'll find in this book of mine, page 85, don't open it now, don't open it now, page 85 you'll find an article from Dar es Salaam of the Sunday News, you'll find there, Jesus' footsteps. And you find in there that this Crucifixion, crucifixion that seven persons, let me read it to you. Let me read it to you. It says here, on Good Friday, at least seven cases of crucifixion were reported in the local press. But the word crucifixion is in inverted commas. Six times in this article, the word crucifixion occur and every time in inverted commas. You know what that means? It means they were not crucifixions. It means the so-called you see, when it is in inverted commas, this is where people talk about crucifixion, but it was not really crucifixion. In inverted commas. Instead of writing every time the so-called crucifixion, the so-called crucifixion, the newspaper loses its value. So they don't want to tell you really, but they put it in inverted commas. This reporter, Rick Gratton, you know, he had the brains. He knew what he was doing. Six times, every time, the word crucifixion is in inverted commas, meaning it was not really the crucifixion. Listen. On Good Friday, at least seven cases of crucifixion were reported in the local press. One of these was, a Lucian, was Luciana Rias, a 23-year-old factory worker and the first woman known to have performed the ritual. First woman got crucified. But she wasn't crucified because she was alive. She, she lived. She's still living. See? So what do you call that? 
these Christians, this attorney from uh, uh, Benuni, a born again Christian, and this guy Josh McDowell, they wrote a book. And in that, they are asking me the question. They haven't got a word in their language for a person going on the cross and going through the ordeal and not dying. Would you say he was crucified when 20 years later somebody shot him or 20 years later he was hanged or five years later a motor car knocked him down? What was his end? Crucified? No. What, was hap what happened on the cross? There is no word in the English language. For that they're making a mockery of me. I said, I'll supply you the word. You know, these educated fools, I tell you, fools. They haven't got a word in their own language to tell us what happened. A man is taken to the gallows. The noose is put around his neck. The rope is pulled. But before the man expires, they cut the rope. Was the man hanged? What? One word. Give me one word in your language. There isn't. You haven't got a word in your language to describe that. Is that my fault? I said, what it is? It is not crucifixion in inverted commas. It is crucifixion. These are fictions taking place. These are fairy tales. Zan. So, a woman now, a woman is doing that. She did it. First woman to do that. The crucifixion, some shown live on television, they show them alive on television, have now become the climax of Easter week in the Philippines. In some cases, they attract thousands of visitors to provincial towns where the atmosphere is a blend of carnival and deep mourning. Something, suggestion for our Christian brethren here. What about enacting something here in Ceres or somewhere around here in Bontivar? Look, you'll get thousands of people coming along to see the fun. They are doing it in the Philippines. They're getting themselves hung on the cross. Nailed, nailed. And they're not dying. It's because they're doing it for kicks. You know, kicks for enjoyment, for pleasure. One man fainted. After being removed from the cross, he had to be carried to a waiting bus. Another was up and smoking a cigarette as soon as his hands were bandaged. These are the crucified people. Who do you call them crucified? Or crucifixed? They're not crucified, crucifixed. And what's taking place is crucifixion. F I C T I O N, fiction. Not F I X I O N. It's not crucifixion, it is crucifixion. F I C T I O N, it's a fiction taking place. And they're doing the real thing, not like what they do in films. They just try and show you as if the man is getting, you know, like these films you see Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the day of triumph, king of kings. They show the man, you know, going through the ordeal. This all acting, play acting. This is no play acting, they will go through the real thing. But this is crucifixions. There are fictions, there are not crucifixions. One of them, Mario Baptus, a 33 year old vendor, had gone through the ritual for the fifth time. He was crucified five times already. For the fifth time every year he's going through the process. And like the baccalaureate penitents, he promised to return next year. He said he had vowed to perform the crucifixions for 10 years after his wife recovered from cancer. 10 years, he's going to do it 10 times. Every year he gets crucified. He's getting crucified? Look, he is getting crucifixed. And these are crucifixions. Fictions. You know, fable, fiction. These are fictions taking place. You, you don't have to go all the way to the Philippines too far, too far. In Natal, yeah, you see it on page 36 and 56 of the book I gave you. Pictures of a man in Natal in Newcastle, crucified man hung on the cross. And he did something more than the Filipinos do. He put a spike through his thigh also to show that the man has his mind over matter. He's proving that, you know, the mind, what it can bear. And he's a barman. Funderburg, Funderburg and Africana. He's done it. Getting crucified on the cross. And then he's brought down. And he's, <laughs> a few days later, he's back to work. Would you say he was crucified? What would you call that? The newspaper is a crucified man hung on cross. Who is he crucified? Crucified means to kill. The man is alive. One word. I say he was being crucifixed. And these are crucifixions. This is not F-I-X-I-O-N. You must call them fictions. These are crucifixions. They're playing with the game. And now the Christians, they give you a choice. Ooh, they give you a choice. This born again, that spirit is coming into them. You'll find that this man here of the campus crusade, he publishes a book. The Resurrection Factor. In that book, on page 47, 
he shows us Jesus Christ on the cross after 1000 hours of actual study on the crucifixion he comes along with this picture you got the book if you haven't on the, when you go out you must get that book it's absolutely free you, you owe it to yourself you must have it his Lord and Savior he put him up like a frog look you'll see that page 47 you'll see it. he's like a frog on the cross actually like a frog so I'm asking now is this froggy fiction as illustrated here and like a frog I didn't do it this is the campus crusade publication page 47 and like a frog you see there on page 47 if you have the book open it and see page 47 you must take it when you go out like a frog page 47 huh or oh, 87 I'm sorry this is 47 of his book his book in his book page 47 I'm sorry yes right Fro Fro froggy fiction as in page 87 then you see the Jehovah's Witnesses they getting the cross stuck in the throat the Jehovah's Witnesses so they said no the Lord was takeified he was put on a stake a totem pole you find that on page 74 he's put on a stake like that not like this like that see that page 74 so now that is takey fiction look they're giving you a choice you can take your choice now what froggy fiction or stakey fiction or crucifixion on page 33 it will show you that he was not nailed page 33 you see what a choice what a choice the Christians are giving you now take your choice either your Lord was froggy fixed or whether he was takey fixed or whether he was crucifixed what the choice they're giving you numerous choices see for yourself we didn't do it we are not theorizing we don't say what happened what not so look this is what you're telling us like a frog like a stake or like a cross what did he do what happened now I will give you a quick summary I give you a quick summary number one that this crucifixion is a fiction that it didn't happen the way the Christians claim those things didn't happen number one he was reluctant to die he didn't want to die he didn't come prepared to come for any type of sacrifice Luke chapter 22 verse 36 you'll find he's preparing for a fight and he had he come to die there was no need for him to tell his disciples to go and arm themselves number two he beseeched God for help Matthew chapter 26 verse 39 number three God heard his prayers Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7 number four an angel of God came to strengthen him Luke chapter 22 verse 43 Pilate finds Jesus not guilty it's good reason to keep Jesus alive John chapter 18 verse 38 number six Pilate's wife shown a dream in which she was told that no harm should come to this just man in the other words that he should be saved alive Matthew chapter 27 verse 19 number seven supposed to be on the cross for only three hours according to the system in vogue no man could die by crucifixion in so short a time which means that even if he was fastened to the cross he was alive number eight the other two his cross mates on the res on the respective crosses were alive so Jesus too for the same period of time must be alive John chapter 19 verse 32 but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already saw what that he was dead already as as you know on page page 36 and 30, 37 and 38 I give you a list of 11 different persons in the newspapers who were certified dead and they were not dead by doctors with stethoscopes they were pronounced dead and they were not dead they came back to life and there is a society in England I have given you the picture of the society of people who have come back from the dead were they all resurrected no but they were certified dead this man seeing a person on the cross he thought he was dead and he saw that he is dead already I said what does it mean and saw when doctors make mistakes in the Hrutskier hospital where Chris Barnard operates a white woman was put certified dead and put into the mortuary next morning she came out alive when you make mistakes by the day certifying people dead when they're not dead what this means that he was dead already so I said Jesus was John 1933 that there was a mistake there in seeing 
Number nine, Encyclopedia Biblica, and the article cross, column 960 says that when the spear was thrust, Jesus was alive. We didn't write the Encyclopedia Biblica. Number ten, and when they launched him on the side with the spear, so forthwith they came out blood and water, which is a sign of life. Number eleven, his legs not broken as a fulfillment of prophecy. I said, legs can be of any use only if Jesus was alive. And this is the fulfillment of prophecy, says the Christian. He keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Psalms chapter 24, verse 20. Number 12. There was a thunderstorm, earthquake and darkening of the sun, all within three hours. To disperse, to disperse the sadistic mob, to enable his secret disciples to help keep him alive. Number 13. The Jews doubted his death. They suspected that he had escaped death on the cross, that he was alive. And now the next day, the next day, they go to Pilate, the chief priests and Pharisees come together into Pilate saying, Sir, we remember so and so, and we don't want to make another mistake like we had made in the first, that the last error shall be worse than the first error. What was the first error they made? You know what? They allowed the body to come down without breaking his legs. Now they want to make doubly sure, but they missed the bus. The Jews missed the bus. You know, yesterday, last night, there was in the Argus that they didn't miss the bus. In Palestine, you know, within, in 24 seconds, 25 seconds, they killed three uh, Arabs and, you know, who were out to do some terrorist business, they killed three. They didn't miss the bus there. But here, in the Bible, Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 to 64, they missed the bus. Because the next day they go along to make the sepulchre secure. Next day, after the horse has bolted, you go and lock the gate. There's something wrong with you. The Bible says, next day, Pilate, number 14, Pilate marvels to hear that Jesus was dead. He said, Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling to him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. Mark chapter 15, verse 44. You only marvel if you know the thing that they're talking didn't happen. If you take a man to a firing squad and you put six bullets through him and if he dies, there's nothing to marvel. But if he didn't die, you marvel. Now Pilate marvels that, look, no man can die within three hours. In other words, according to his experience, the man is alive. Number 15, big and roomy chamber, big roomy chamber, close at hand and big and airy for willing hands to come to the rescue. Providence was out to keep Jesus alive. Number 16, stone and winding sheets had to be removed only necessary if Jesus was alive. John chapter 20 verse 1. Number 17. Report on the winding sheets. German scientists who carried out experiments on the shroud of Turin said that the heart of Jesus had not stopped functioning, that he was alive. Number 18. He was ever in disguise. Disguise not necessary if Jesus was resurrected. Only necessary if he was alive. John chapter 21 verse 4. Number 19, he forbade Mary Magdalene to touch him. Touch me not, for this reason that it would hurt, because he was alive. John chapter 20 verse 17. Number 20, not yet ascended unto my father. In the language of the Jew, in the idiom of the Jew, he was saying, I am not dead yet. In other words, I am alive. John chapter 20 verse 17. Number 21, Mary Magdalene not afraid on recognizing Jesus. Because she had seen signs of life before. She was looking for a Jesus who was alive. John chapter 20 verse 16. Number 22. His disciples petrified on seeing Jesus in the upper room. All their knowledge about the crucifixion was from hearsay. Therefore they could not believe that Jesus was alive. Two had Almal, Humfarlat and Khaflak. They were not there. Number 23. At food again and again in his post crucifixion appearances. Food only necessary if he was alive. Luke chapter 24, verse 43. Number 24. Never showed himself to his enemies because he had escaped death by the skin of his teeth. He was alive. Number 25. Took only short trips because he was not resurrected, not spiritualized, but alive. He went to Emmaus. He went to the upper room, back again after eight days. He only took short trips because he was not resurrected. Otherwise, he would have gone up to heaven. No sense in going and coming back up and down, up and down, not from heaven to down and up above. He's going around, in and around Jerusalem all the time. Number 26, testimony of men around the tomb. They say, why seek ye the living among the dead? Why are you looking for a live person among dead people in the cemetery? 
Luke chapter 24 verse 4 and 5 that he is not dead but alive why seek ye the living among the dead number 27 testimony of the angels the angels say the angels who had said that he was alive that he lever that he lever that he is alive I don't know what's wrong with people what are you reading the angels what did they say that is resurrected no he said that he lever he is alive they said no he is not alive he's dead he did not say resurrected but the actual word uttered by the angels was alive luke chapter 24 verse 23 28 mary magdalene testifies they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her they believed not mark 16 11. mary did not watch for a spook or a ghost or spirit of jesus but a live jesus what they could not believe was that the master was alive mark 16 11. number 29 dr primrose a senior anesthetist of the royal Glasgow Infirmary, he says that the water in the blood was an account of scourging by staves and upset of the nervous vessels, that which was a sure sign that Jesus was alive. And now, the last and final one for tonight, Jesus had himself foretold that he was going to remain alive. Ma, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, 39, 40. He himself had told that he was not to die. That is his prophecy. The Jews come to him again. They were coming again and again, making a mockery of the master, Rabbi, Mr. Ansul Chrach, a Tirkin van Isin. So, Master, we would have a sign of thee. We want you to show us a miracle to convince us that you are the man we are waiting for. You are our Messiah. And Jesus answered and said for Hala, a slechter and a speliger geslaagd, zoek naar een teken en geen teken zal aan hom gegeer word nie. It's an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after the sign, but there shall no sign be given unto it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Want soos Jonah, drie da en drie nachte, in die hart van die groot vis was, so sal die sien van die mans, drie da en drie nachte, in die hart van die aard vis. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. The only sign, he said, I'm prepared to give you is this, the sign of Jonah. And we are asking our Christian brethren, what was that sign? You know what was the sign of Jonah? Go to the book of Jonah. This is the book of Jonah. This is the book of Jonah. One page in the Bible. I enlarge it for you. It's hard to find. But you find it. You don't have to even go to it. If anybody has been to Sunday school, he knows the whole story. This is the book. This is the book of Jonah. I'm not exaggerating. There is only one page in the Bible called the book of Jonah. This one here. Front and back. Four short chapters. It won't take you two minutes to read it, but you don't have to do that. You, everybody knows the story. The Hindu knows it, the Christian knows it, the Muslim knows it, the Jew knows it, everybody knows about Jonah. Jonah and the whale. So Jesus says, the sign, the miracle that I'm going to show you is the miracle of Jonah. So we are asking, what miracle did Jonah perform? So you go to the book of Jonah, and you read there that Jonah was sent to the Ninevites. A city called Nineveh of a hundred thousand people. God Almighty tells him, go to Nineveh and warn the people that they must repent in sackcloth and in ashes. Meaning they must humble themselves before the Lord. But Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, he goes to Joppa. And he's running away. He's going to Tarshish. Because he's despondent that these materialistic people, wicked and adulterous generation of his time, they will not listen to me. So presumptuously, he is running away. And at sea, there's a storm. And according to the superstitions of these people, anybody who runs away from his master's command creates such a turmoil at sea. So they began to question who can be responsible. So Jonah, Yunus, Hadrat Yunus alayhi salam, Jonah now realizes that he's the guilty man because he's running away from his master's command. So he volunteers. He said, look, I'm the guilty man. God is after my blood and he's going to sink the boat to kill me. And in the process, you innocent people will die. You rather take me and you throw me overboard it will be all right for you. He makes a manly comeback. They say, no, 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 no. You might be wanting to commit suicide. You want us to help you? No, no. We have our own system of finding out right from wrong. What is called casting of lots, like head or tail. 
and according to that system it came to the turn of Jonah that Jonah was the guilty man so they took him and they threw him overboard so we are asking our Christian brethren that when they threw him overboard was he dead or was he alive but to make it easy for them we have to tell them that look this man volunteered and when a man volunteers you don't have to strangle him before throwing when a man volunteers you don't have to spear him before throwing when a man volunteers you don't have to break his arm or limb before throwing am I right he volunteered he said throw me so when they threw him overboard was he dead or was he alive what do you say what do you say tell me quickly alive a little more loud I want to hear it from your mouth alive a fish comes and gobbles him up dead or alive alive from the fish's belly he's praying to God for help do dead people pray no so he was alive three days and three nights the fish takes him around the ocean dead or alive alive on the third day vomits him on the seashore alive look Jesus said for as Jonah was so shall the son of man be the only miracle he didn't say blind body must I healed him you know that woman with issues she was bleeding for ages and she touched me and she got healed you know those two thousand pigs I destroyed you know the fig tree I dried it up from its very roots nothing you know Lazarus I brought him back from the dead nothing the only sign I'm giving you is the sign of Jonah what happened to Jonah is going to happen to me the miracle of Jonah is my miracle so we are asking how was Jonah dead or alive and the Jew says he was alive and the Christians say he was alive and the Muslims say he was alive for three days and three nights the man was alive through and through it's a miracle it's a miracle that you throw a man into a raging sea and he doesn't die it's a miracle a fish gobbles a man he ought to die he didn't die it's a miracle three days and three nights suffocation and heat in the whale's belly he ought to die he didn't die it's a miracle it's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle can you see impossibility but that's what makes it a miracle a sign now ask our Christian brethren how was Jesus in the tomb for three days and three nights? 1,200 million Christians, they say he was dead. Is that like Jonah in your language or unlike Jonah in your language? Is that Suas Yona or Ni Suas Yona? Ask them in your language. The man says once Suas Yona, Suas Yona, like Jonah, Jengo Jonah. Yes. I said, in your language, please tell me, you are telling me, Jesus said he'll be like Jonah. You are telling me he was unlike Jonah. So who's speaking the truth, you or Jesus? Who is speaking the truth? Is Jesus a lying or you are lying? Tell me now. Who between the two of you, the thousand million Christians or Jesus Christ? Who is not speaking the truth? Will you please tell us? He said he'll be like Jonah and, you say, and that's the only miracle. No, 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 they say he said no he was emphasizing the time factor can't you see he said for as Jonah was three days and three nights so shall the son of man be three days and three nights he uses the word three four times to emphasize the time factor I said look there's nothing miraculous about a time factor three days and three nights is not a miracle the miracle is you expect a man to die and he doesn't die that's a miracle you know the first time I came to your country beautiful mother city you know it took me three days and three nights in the train, that old train, Orange Express, three days. So it's a miracle. The miracle of Dida took him three days and three nights. Is that a miracle? It took me three days and three nights, man, coming from Durban to Cape Town. Three days and three nights. I said, look, it's a miracle. He said, nonsense, silly. And how can you talk like that? Yes, how can I talk like that? He says, there's nothing miraculous about three days and three nights, or three weeks and, and, and three years, what it is, nothing. But the man, drowning man, clutching at straws, his whole salvation is depending on this. So he says, it's the, day, the night and day. He says, no, it's a time factor. I says, all right, time factor. When was he crucified? So it's a Friday afternoon. How long was he on the cross? Some say three hours, some say six hours. I say, whatever you say, I accept. You know, the Jews were in a hurry to put him up. You know why? Because of the general public. He was a hero to the people. He was a hero to the people. And if your hero's life is in danger, there could be a riot. People think it can go out of hand. So before that happens, quickly, quickly, hurry, hurry, hurry. They want to hang him up. But when they put him up according to the scriptures, they're now in a hurry to bring him down. You know why? Because of the Sabbath. And on Friday at sunset, according to the Jewish calculation, it is Saturday. We are now Saturday. According to Jews, this is Sunday. We are in Sunday night. 
according to Islamic calculation, we are in Sunday night. But for you sage, we say Saturday night. Meet us here, otherwise you get confused. So before sunset on Friday, they had to bring the body down. And they say they brought it down. I said, all right. And they give him a burial wash, which takes a couple of hours, according to this campus crusade author. Couple of hours. And they put 100 pound weight of medicants around the man. Camphor and frankincense and what? 100 pounds. He just dumped it like that, 100 pounds. And then they put a winding sheet around him. By the time they finish, it's already evening. So Friday night, in the evening, they're supposed to have put him into the sepulcher. Right? And the whole Christian world says, right. So Friday night, he's supposed to be in the grave. I said, watch my fingers. He says, right. He says, right. Saturday daytime, he's divided. Jesus divided the day into day and night part. So we do the same. Saturday day, he's still supposed to be in the grave. Right? He said, right. Saturday night, he's still supposed to be in the grave. Right? He says, right. Sunday morning, first day of the week, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and the tomb is empty. Right? He says, right. So how many days and how many nights? Believe me, that the learned man, the born again, he's looking between my two hands. I said, what's wrong? Can't you see? Look at this man. No, he can't. He's puzzled. You know why? Because once was Yona, three die and three nachta. When the ha, when the Khrut was, so the soul is seen from him, three die and three nachta. is in. For as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. He has seen that. Now when he sees this, he's puzzled. Something has gone wrong. He's going to get caught. So he can't say, he's, he's make, make, he can't make up his mind. I said, look, I will help you again. Look. I said, suppose, suppose, suppose. You know why? Because he could have come out Friday night. Around there was this vegetable garden and this his secret disciples home mansion but because the Bible doesn't say we won't say so watch again Friday night right Saturday day right Saturday night right Sunday morning he's not there right this is right how many days and how many nights It's two nights in a day look even an Einstein can't help you here so he failed again a second time he said he'll be like Jonah you say he's not unlike Jonah you say, the Christians say he's unlike Jonah. That means one of you is lying, either Jesus Christ or you. You must decide between the two of you who is a liar. Number three, number two, you said, he said three and three and you only see two and one. He failed a second time. So now these plain truth people, you know the plain, Armstrong family, Armstrong. This Armstrong family, they say, no, there is no such thing as a Good Friday. This is a pagan idea. These are pagans. This Easter is pagan. Christmas is pagan. Who says the plain truth? Six million copies a month they give out free. Beautiful magazine. You saw it. Beautiful magazine. Look at this. Free. Absolutely free. They say that it was a Good Wednesday when Christ was crucified. Not a Good Friday. It was a good Wednesday. See, you must count backwards. From Sunday morning, count backwards. So when you cut backwards, you minus three and three, then you get good Wednesday. So now you start going forward, you'll get Sunday morning, three and three, you'll get it fulfilled. So it's a good Wednesday. I said, look, my people, I'm telling you now, you must be on guard because this magazine is very progressive. Sooner or later, all the Christians will opt for this. I'm telling you. And when that happens, our government is going to change Good Friday to Good Wednesday. And I want to tell you that when that happens, if I'm alive, I will come down from Durban and we will march on to Parliament House. And I want you to follow me. On to Parliament House, protesting that we don't want to change Good Friday. You know why? Because on Good Friday, we get the maximum number of people coming to our masjids. No? You know, people far and wide, they're working here and there. We can't get together on Fridays. A lot of our people can't even come for Juma. But on Good Fridays, no excuse. And our Imam gets extra time to lecture to us. No? Then, when it's Good Friday, we get four days holiday. If it's Good Wednesday, you will never get four days holiday. <laughs> so won't you march with me on to Parliament House? Yes! We must protest. So, I'm asking this head of this movement, he was in Durban, a Mr. Faye, so I said, now, very, you know the way, the Christians, they lap it up. When these new things come out, they lap it up. They all lap it up. No, not, they don't ask questions. And they won't answer questions. These Christians, they go along and to deliver lectures, but they will not allow themselves to be questioned. We say, come and question us. Go ahead. 
So I said, no, privately you can talk to him. So I'm asking him, I said, look, man, uh, it sounds very beautiful, this Good Wednesday business of yours, but how is it that the Roman Catholics for 2,000 years, you know, they say they have an unbroken chain of popes. How is it that they were deceived? And this thousand million Christians are all deceived. I said, who deceived them? They don't know the difference between a Good Friday and a Good Wednesday. Who deceived them? So he says, the devil. He said, the devil deceived them. I said, if the devil can deceive the Christians in such a simple thing about a good Wednesday or a good Friday, how much easier for the devil to deceive you in the more important things of the spirit, in the more important things of God. What is the devil worried about Wednesday or Friday? What does it hurt him? Where does it hurt him? Nobody will hurt him. But instead of worshipping the one true God, he makes you to worship a created creature, a created being. That would hurt him. So if he's successful in elementary things, how much easier for him to succeed in the serious things of life. So my dear brothers and sisters, we have given you the literature and we have given you the format how to go about doing the job. You have to memorize some of these verses. You see, it says, cake now may hand and may footer. Bandh disease excel. Memorize it in Afrikaans and memorize it in English. So your Afrikaans is improving, your English is improving. And you are doing a double job. Every time you're quoting, you're giving a two hit. In Afrikaans and in English. Afrikaans and English. Look, you are privileged. Allah has given you that privilege. You are all bilingual. So do it bilingually. Learn the verses in Afrikaans, learn it in English. And the people that you're talking to also, they are bilingual. So two blows. Afrikaans, English. Afrikaans, English. May I wish you the best, I wish you all the success in this work of Dawa and may Allah bari ta'ala. Look, it is possible that in our lifetime we can change this country. It's possible. You just do a little bit of homework, a little exertion and Allah will do the rest for you. Because we don't have to apologize for anything. You know, Allah has put us in that such a position. You don't have to apologize for anything. At every step, it is the Christian who has to apologize for his religion. He must apologize for his Bible. He apologizes for his trinity. He apologizes for everything he has to apologize. You don't have to apologize for anything. So, go to town. And this is a privilege Allah has given us. Allah says, it's to you. He has given you a deen. Master, overcome and supersede every other way of life. Wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Thank you very much, Mr. Didat, for a very lively lecture. We also thank each and every one of you who has come here tonight to listen to it. We would like to remind you that the free literature that you had been given should please be passed on to your friends, particularly if you have taken more than one copy of any one particular kind. The translations of the Quran in English and in Afrikaans are for sale. 750 each, two for 10 rands. The normal price, 20, uh, 15 rands for two and 10 rands each. The Afrikaans translation, five rands per copy. Tonight, it is four rands. We also like to bring your attention to the fact that the tape, the cassette tapes, will be ready. There are some already completed. And the videos will be completed in about three weeks from now. We have here, though, for sale already, a video recording of the program on SATV, SABC TV, Islam and Christianity, which is a copy of the debate that took place. This 25 rands, when you finish with it, you give it back, you get your 25 rands. So also for the videos of this series, write to Durban, send your 25 rands, get your copy, once you've seen it, shown your friends, made your 10 copies, send it back, you get your 25 rands. It is now, the lecture is over. There are many people who understand that if I go to a lecture, I expect to have the lecture ended and then I go home. 
is ready to have a question time. Here, we do have a question time. But I say, if this gathering has been organized by us, then I do believe that we reserve the right to state the format. We will allow questions. We will allow you to come and make a statement. We will allow you to come and point out a correction. And yet the statement and the correction, if you know how to phrase it, you can turn it into a question too. But you're free to come and make a statement or a correction and even a question. We do not see this as a debate. We do not see this as mudslinging or an argument. If you want a debate, please, on any of these subjects, hire a hall, inform Mr. Didat, inform the thousands of the public, and let him sweat it out with you. But please, not a debate here. If there's any question that you have, please ask it here. I beg of you, do not ask the question outside. The man is tired, it is late. And I also ask our Muslim brethren, please do not participate in questions outside tonight. I don't believe that we can gain anything from it. I also ask the audience that if somebody puts a question and an answer is given to him, or he can't put his question, please don't laugh. We are tolerant. On the other hand, people putting up from the microphone, please don't become emotional. All questions must pertain to the topic that was under discussion tonight. I think that is fair. If they, I remind you now of the lectures on Monday night and on Tuesday night, Athlone Civic Center Monday night and at Kensington Civic on Tuesday night. If there is any question, please come to the microphone here. There's more than one question or somebody to point out the correction. You can stand behind. I will be as tolerant and as considerate as possible, but I will stop you and I will ask you please to sit down if you go beyond the limits. Thank you. Yeah. Instead of wasting time, if there's another question, you, question you can queue up. Mr. Amadidat, the word crucifixion with a C T I O N, where did you get that word? Because why? I went to the library and I picked, picked out a uh, Arabic dictionary with English and I was looking and I don't find it in all the other dictionaries because here I have it in the tool is written to prove it that there's no other word as you have said. Thank you. You see, I, I'm solving the problem for the Christians. They do not have a word in their language. The Oxford Dictionary hasn't got it. The Webster Dictionary hasn't got it. In the languages of the Christian world, there is no such word that a man goes on the cross, he goes through all the process, and he doesn't die. One verb, one verb for that is non-existent in any Western language. So therefore, I am trying to get them out of the misery. They are in a misery. You listening? I want you to listen, because now what I'm talking, you want to talk. I said, please, I have understand. patience. When you spoke, I just sat down, gave you a full chance. Now, just listen. So I want to get the Christians out of their misery of not finding a word. They're putting them in inverted commas. That book that is given to you, you see there's six times crucifixions in inverted commas. So what is the inverted comma for? That means it is not crucifixion. Then what is it? So therefore, I said, look, because you don't have a word, I am coining it for you. And very soon it can happen in the next Oxford Dictionary, you'll find this word coming in because they didn't think of it. I am thinking and I'm giving it to you. I am putting that word in your mouth now. Whenever you say about that other fiction, you see, Thunderberg, what happened to him? Was, there was, was he crucified? 
So he says, no. What happened? Well, he was crucifixed. So you learn the word from me. If you keep on using that, the Oxford Dictionary and the Webster Dictionary and the all, they'll have to start adopting, taking our word and putting it into the dictionary. Because they didn't think of it before. That's how new words come in. So this is my creation. Thank you. Next question, please. Could you speak into the microphone, please? Right. Ah, just give me a break. Don't mind. Uh, Could you speak into the yeah, mouthpiece? I will do that. This, Mr. Dirat, uh, are you aware that the swooning theory, the swooning theory, that Christ swooned upon the cross or fainted upon the cross, was first put forward by a man named Venturina some 200 years ago? It has been resuscitated in recent times by a Muslim sect called the Ahmadiyya. Uh, the next question will be... Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Is uh, that a question? Yeah. So one question at a time, please. Uh, I'm, all right, thank you. But I thought I'll, I'll ask three so you can answer three one time. It's in connection and, with the same thing. All right, but I mean, uh, with, no, I'm, not, I'm not giving a pun, but I wouldn't like a trinity of questions. <laughs> That's one, right. please. Okay. Right. All right. Yes, for the next question, it'll be in right. Take your t uh, place at the back here. Yeah. If you have heard me correctly tonight, everything that I have been proving to you was from the Christian Bible. I never used the word soon in all my life, in all my lectures. For, I'm lecturing for more than 20 years now, but I never used the word soon at any time. I'm only telling you that Mary Magdalene says that he is alive. The angel said that he is alive. The two men that were around the tomb, they say he is alive. So I am only using your scripture exactly as it says. I don't go for Venturian and I don't go for Mirza Gula Muhammad for anybody else. The Bible which you have in your hand, I have used it. And now you tell me now where I have gone wrong in using your Bible to prove my case that Christ was not crucified. Thank you. The lady, please into the microphone. Um, Mr. Dida, actually there's actually quite a few things that uh, errors which you have made tonight in twisting the word of God, saying things of the word of God, you made a whole mockery of the word of God in Christianity which we as Christians wouldn't do of Islam and the Holy Quran and that breaks my heart tonight. But what I would like to do is to just read three verses of the Word of God, if you've really been studying the Word of God, I'd like to know what you have to say on these, just these three verses which I've jotted down amongst many others, but the time is not there. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And then in John chapter 11, Verse 25 we read, Jesus said unto her, this was to Martha with the raising of Lazarus, Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And also in Revelation, the last book in the Bible, chapter 1 verse 18 we read, Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Thank you very much. The only verse which has any connection with the subject of this evening's discussion was the last verse quoted from the book of Revelation, where Jesus is supposed to be telling to John in a dream, in a vision, that I was dead and now I live forevermore. That's the only place in the whole Bible where Jesus utters such a word. During his post-crucifixion appearances, as recorded in the Gospels, he never used the word that I had died and I have come back from the dead. Never! This is the only place and this is a dream, a vision that John had seen. And in dreams we dream anything. And more especially in the book of Revelation you read, about the beast, you know, and the beast had eyes, how many eyes had it outside, and had eyes inside, and eyes outside, it had seven horns, 
I said, look, this is something, you know, look, it is not historical, it is not factual, uh, an imagination of man, and we all, it happens to me sometimes when I eat too much, then you have these dreams, this indigestible thing, too much meat, and you go to sleep, and then you dream, you have uh, nightmares. So this is like a man who is dreaming, but I still claim, make bold to say, that Jesus Christ, while he walked this earth, he never used the word at any time, telling anybody, anywhere, that I was dead, and now I have come back from the dead. He's proving to the contrary, that I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm the same fellow, eating food, have the need of food, and shelter, and hiding from the Jews, afraid of the Jews, simply because he didn't die, and he didn't conquer death. Because if he had died, and if he had conquered death, there would have been no need for him to be afraid anymore. Because the resurrected bodies can't die twice. Who says so? The Bible. It says it is ordained unto all men once to die, and after that the judgment. But because he didn't die, he had every reason to be afraid and terrified, every reason for a disguise. That was the only connection that your quotation had with the subject of this evening's talk, madam. Next question, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Mr. Adidas. First of all, I would like to get an invitation when you get your doctorate because you invent a few new words. I think it would be quite interesting to get, you know, to the ceremony when you get, you know, your doctorate because you invent a few new words. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a few things tonight concerning spirits. You made some very strong statements here that a, a spirit cannot eat, cannot be seen, etc. Now, I would like to refer the audience and yourself to Surah 19, verse 17, the Surah of Mary. Here we see, he read, We sent unto her our spirit, and it assumed for her the likeness of a, prophet, uh, of, of a perfect man. In other words, we read here clearly that God sent a spirit, and it appeared in the likeness of a man. In other words, this man was seen, this man was hurt and most probably even could have been touched. We are not told about that. But you told us many fairy tales. We can assume this also, I think, tonight. And so I think, you know, we must ask the question. Sorry. Do we? Yeah, the question. We ask the question. Do we believe the Quran as, or do you believe the Quran as your guidance, as revelation? Then don't talk in this way about the spirits and about the resurrected Christ. Then we must also ask the question. Whom do we give more authority? A word of a man or a word of Jibreel, a word of an angel? It says in the Holy Quran, or it says in the Bible, when Jesus was risen, the tomb was, the stone was rolled away from the tomb. Mary Magdalene, she saw an angel inside, and the angel said, He is risen. Do you believe more an angel or a woman who comes and tells the people, He is alive? Right, thank you. Now, if you know your Bible, and it seems that you know your Bible too well, you Shh. read in your Bible that the disciples of John came to Jesus to ask him, Are you the one that cometh, or do we seek or wait for another? That word, disciples of John, in your original Greek Bible, which I take you have it, you re read there, the Greek word there is agilos. And agilos means angels. This is in the Schofield's Bible, if you want to have a look. The word there in Greek is agilos, and agilos means angels. So, but you, when you're translators, when you're translating for the disciples of John, you don't say the angels of John. What do you say? The disciples of John. When it suits you that the person is angelic, you say, ah, you are an angel. So when it suits you, you translate angel as an angel, and when it suits you, you translate angel as disciples. So who was this inside? Does Mary say that this creature had wings? This angel had wings? When you quoted the Quran, you said, that the person that came, the angel came to her as a perfect man, a man in all respects. In other words, in appearance, it appeared to her like a man. If he appeared like an electromagnetic wave, can you imagine what would have happened to Mary? If he appeared like an elephant, you know what would have happened to her? So the natural thing God Almighty does is, he 
When he is sending his message to anybody, he makes that person to receive. So he appeared as a man, the angels can appear as man, but Jesus Christ is proving to the contrary. He is telling that I am not what you are thinking. He says a spirit has no flesh and bones. You are thinking that I'm a spirit. He said, I'm not that. Because if I was, I wouldn't have this. Simple logic. He's proving to the end. He's eating food. To prove what? That I'm the same fellow man. What's wrong with you? I'm not that apparition. You asked me some questions. May I, I didn't ask you any question. I'm yes. telling you. You just asked me, you know, he uh, ate food. Is, I'm he? telling you this. This is my statement to you. It's he had a glorified a body as such. He could eat, but he didn't have to eat. Uh, brother, uh, I take it you know the rhetorical question, right? That was a rhetorical question. Many things. Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, I would like to correct three or four st statements. Could you make it three? Right. And then I'd like to ask a question at the end. All right, fair. If you don't mind. Mr. Didat, you offered 20 rand to ask the people who quoted, and I'll shorten the, st the statement, bring the people here that I may slay them. And you quoted that Jesus mentioned that in Luke chapter 19. But if you read that scripture properly, you would have noted that Jesus was, ref uh, was actually telling the people a parable about a master and asking his servants what they did with the talents that he gave them. And at the end of the parable, the master said, bring the people here that I may slay them. And the second um, little comment that I would like to make during your address you quoted Jesus as praying in the Garden of Geth, um, a ceremony, and you said that the angel came to strengthen him. And then you put in your own words, which the Bible does not have, no translation has it, that they came to his rescue. Now, how could you jump to a conclusion like that, that the angel came to strengthen them in order to come to his rescue? Thank you. That all it, it, and it would be, it's difficult for me yeah. to follow all the questions to give an answer. I think it must be pretty difficult there also. But, you uh, made, you made two corrections. No, he's made two corrections, which, which, which he's got to reply to. Yes, right. okay. So if you stop there and put your question, then it would be fair. I think. Okay. Now my question is unrelated to that, but very much related to your address. You said that... Muhammad had the revelation in the Bible that Jesus was not crucified and neither did he die. And you said that Allah revealed that to him. Now, no other witnesses, you are taking that statement from one man. And apparently, according to my little knowledge about Islam and the Quran, Muhammad went to his wife and shared this news with her. But in the Bible... Yes, yes. It, what, you said that uh, Muhammad وسلم, then went to his wife, Sitana Khadija, Allah be pleased with her, and said, I have seen this, I have had this revelation. But in the Bible, after Jesus had risen from the dead, if you look in that same chapter, Luke chapter 24, when he, from verse, I'll write it down here, from verse, you know, 45, and it is in another place other than that revelation scripture, when he expressed that he had to die, he actually mentioned that word death at that stage also. And in Corinthians, the Bible says that he appeared to the 12 first and then to 500 people thereafter. Now, let me... Explain just one thing to you. Could we get the question? That is that? the question because Muhammad had no witnesses. Jesus had 500 witnesses. Right. And more. Shh. Now, who is more to believe? Je uh, uh, the Bible or the Quran? Right. Thank you very much. We do not have to go 
into the pros and cons of the Bible or the Quran. You see, I have used your scripture. Jesus himself is proving that I am not what you are thinking. Again and again, he is in disguise. Mary Magdalene can't recognize him. His disciples can't recognize him. When he returns, the disciples are terrified. Every reason I'm giving you, the reason for the fear is because they had no first-hand knowledge. All the knowledge is from hearsay. When you come to talking about parable that Jesus Christ was giving a parable, a parable is a story form of something that is actually he's describing. What is the parable about? He had told his disciples that they were going to sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Not so? It was so. So while he is going to Jerusalem, he is giving them the parable that look, we are given certain talents. Each and every one was given certain opportunities. If you do not carry out the opportunity, don't fulfill it, all these things will be taken away from you. You are given so many talents, what did you do with it? You were given so many opportunities, what did you do with it? And now comes the supreme opportunity of establishing the kingdom of God. And they, the Bible said it was immediately appear it was immediately to appear so in that context and he's marching to Jerusalem he's marching to Jerusalem and he's telling for those my enemies who what is the parable about whose enemies what is the parable for he's telling them that look this is it for my enemies who would not that I should reign over them who is this other person who wants to reign over the people and who is telling them that they should kill the people if they don't allow them to rule who he is talking about himself. He is talk, talking about who oh, God is coming along to reign over them. Almighty God, in the day of judgment, he will rule. He is not the enemies of God. He had to go and bring. He is going to tell you and me, bring my enemies. God is so powerless that he is depending on you and me that he is going to bring his enemies before him and slay them before me. He hasn't got people to do the job. However, you see, you have quoted so many things that each and everything calls for a lecture. When you talk about one witness, Muhammad is testifying that God Almighty has revealed this to him. Now, when you take anybody's witness, Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, you find that Matthew, you say he bore witness, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and you find that Matthew didn't write Matthew, Mark didn't write Mark, Luke didn't write Luke and John didn't write John. This is, this is in your Bible, it says the gospel according to St. Matthew, the gospel according to St. Mark, the gospel according to St. Luke, the gospel according to St. John. And I have been asking learned men of your religion, uh, one point, what is this according, according, according? In other words, this is what you assume. You see, when you read the internal evidence of the book that you are quoting, take Matthew, Matthew 9.9. 9, you find Matthew didn't write it. He says, while he, Jesus, was going forth into the way, he saw a tax collector called Matthew. And he, Jesus, came up to him, telling him, Matthew, follow me, Jesus. And he, Matthew, followed him, Jesus. Look, ask any school child, who's talking? Is Matthew talking this? Or is Jesus talking this? Whose words are these? So is neither Matthew, nor Jesus, nor God. This is somebody speaking from hearsay. This is the type of witness that you have got. One man copying the other, wholesale. And this is what your J.B. Phillips says. The prebendary of the Chichester Cathedral in England, he says that early tradition ascribed this gospel to the Apostle Matthew. But scholars nowadays almost all reject this view. That means Matthew didn't even write Matthew. So this is the word of the books that you are quoting, my friend. This book, the Quran, is God's word. And Monday night, I'm proving to you people, anybody, everybody, visually, that this is the word of God. And if God says, Jesus said, the disciple is not greater than the master. If God Almighty, when he speaks, his word is more authoritative than the billions of mankind. The word of Jesus is more authoritative than the billions of the Christians. Jesus says, you remember that I will be like Jonah. That's what Jesus said. And you are telling me, you're not answering any of my questions at all. For one and a half hour, I have been proving to you from your book. Jesus said this and I said, Jesus said that. Jesus said he'll be like Jonah and you say he's not like Jonah. Why don't you prove that, look, he is like Jonah. I said, Jesus said he'll be like Jonah and you saying he is unlike Jonah. 
Jesus said it'll be three days and three nights and you say it's two and one. Why don't you settle that problem? There is the problem about the crucifixion. You are getting into sidelines, giving prophecies after the event. You know, what is Sinim ex eventu, prophecies after the event. The books were written decades after the event. You know that. It was not written in the lifetime of Jesus. Not one word was written in his lifetime, nor did he instruct anybody to write a word. This is the whole, the worth of the whole testimony that you have got. Sir, uh, one point please. Uh, excuse me, the fellow with the green shirt. I'm a Muslim, but I stand here, I try to be as impartial as possible, right? Only person that interdicts you is myself. If you perhaps take too long to put your question, I don't think Mr. Dida does. Could you please not interject when he answers, right? Thank you. Mr. Chairman and people... You're too short, you're like me. Please put the mic down, please. I would like to ask, uh, when a person becomes a cabinet maker or a carpenter, there are laws to obey and principles before you can. You can't just take a piece of wood, otherwise you wouldn't know what to do. So the Bible teaches us that to interpret the scriptures, that uh, it's only by the Holy Spirit that we can interpret the scriptures. And uh, you can only uh, have the Spirit of God when you obey the God, when you obey the Lord. In other words, when I obey God's word, like for instance, you will know about Muhammad if you obey the Quran. So you can talk about Mu Muhammad. Now I just want to read to you. Just hold it. You are putting a question now. Yeah, but I just want to make my, my point clear. Yeah, in First, Second Peter, uh, chapter one, verse twenty-one. For no. No, you must look. Speak into the microphone. For no prophetic message ever came just from the will of man, but men were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. And then in the book of John, chapter 14, uh, verse 15. Brother, uh, could I no, wait, ask, what, yeah, but what are you trying to prove or what question would you like to ask? Wait, I'll ask you now. I know that you've got support, you know, there in the text. Yes. But now, could we get the question? Right, okay. The question is, if you become a, a bricklayer or a carpenter, you must, do you have to obey the principles and the laws to become that? Or can you just become a bricklayer or a, or a carpenter? carpenter? Thank you very much. Can you answer me? Now, yeah. likewise, I would just make clear to you, you can't interpret God's word. If you don't obey God's word, then you won't have the spirit. So I would say then, any person that is not living according to the word of God, He's got no right to interpret the scriptures because here yeah, God says it's only the spirit that will enlighten your mind right, and give you I, wisdom. I will, am I right then that if, uh, not to get into that part of the argument, but taking your word without going there, if I'm a Muslim and I haven't got the spirit which you speak of, and yes. the Bible is, as you say, for all mankind, yes. will I then not be able to understand or interpret it? Well, you can have the Bible, but Christ said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't obey me? It right. is only those who obey God that have the Spirit. Thank so you. I'll read further. Thank in you, brother. I think your point, and I don't doubt your next text, it will only be supporting the same thing. But could the, we, for uh, time's sake, could wait, we please wait, go on? But I, I feel the no person can interpret the word without the Spirit of God. See, So yes. if a person is not born again, Right. Then he doesn't have the spirit, so he either the devil will use him no, or he will talk things out of his head. No, I don't, I don't doubt your, your thoughts on it, but I think we have got your, the picture. Yes. We will answer you. Could we go to the back, please? We'll only have three more questions after this, eh? Please. Now, Mr. Oh, we'll make it four because there are four standing. Could I excuse you, please, with the blazer? We'll have four more. Um, Mr. Didat, did you hear that man's question? You didn't hear his question. You don't want me to answer. I heard his question, but Then you don't I want me to answer. You do okay, not want me to answer. Him. Answer him. Sorry for that. Answer him. I want to. Could you go? I want to. Could you go? <laughs> you see, it's an amazing situation. That our Christian brethren say that you must have the spirit before you can understand the Bible. Mm -hmm. And everybody claims to have the spirit. There are in South Africa 1,000 different sects and denominations among the whites. 1,000 different sects and denominations among the whites and they all claim to have got the spirit there are 3,000 sects and denominations among the Africans 3,000 and they all got the spirit and these thousand white denominations are all going in different directions and they all got the spirit the 3,000 African denominations they all claim the spirit and they all also going in different directions 
Now, how are we going to arrive at truth? Unless we use our God-given intelligence. Because the one man says, look, there is a trinity in the Bible. The other fellow says, there is no trinity in the Bible. One fellow says that when you take this piece of bread, it becomes the flesh of Jesus. When you drink the wine, it becomes the blood of Jesus, literally, in a mystical way. The other fellow says, no, it is metaphorical. Now, who has got the spirit? I want to know. Which guy are we going to believe? And as soon as you ask the man what church you belong to, he doesn't own up. He's interdenominational, so you can't catch him anyway. As soon as you corner him, he says, well, I don't believe that. Look, what I have done, I have spoken for an hour and a half, simple, straightforward language, proving to you from the Christian scriptures that the thing that they are alleging didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen. Christ was not crucified, he was not crucified, he was not crucified. An amazing thing, nobody is asking, questioning me on what I said, not one. Isn't it amazing? What is the spirit doing to them? What does the spirit do to people that you are not listening simple basic English I'm speaking to you I'm quoting you verses after verses this is what Jesus said and you don't contradict me you want to say Peter said this and Corinthians said this and this guy said this what is all this? What is happening to you? Where is the, why is the spirit deserting people? I says please ask me direct questions on what I spoke and I'll give you a direct answer uh, gentlemen, uh, let me be fair. Uh, when I looked at you just now, I said three more questions. Then out of courtesy, I saw there were four of you. Right. So I said, all right, four. But now we have five. I've in fact, will you withdraw? Thank you. Um, <coughs> sorry, I want to ask Life Challenge to forgive me because what I do, it isn't to say that I'm yes, here sir. every night. John, will you just but put the a question? Just, just go ahead and uh, ask yeah. The question is, Mr. Ahmadi, that before Christ was crucified, the Romans also crucified the person, people. But you know why Christ died, actually? Christ didn't die of excruciating pain. The thing was this, he died, the scripture says, that he died of a broken heart. And now Mr. Ahmadi, that proved to say that he wasn't crucified, it wasn't he. Now who was then crucified? And the thing is this, when Mary came to the tomb, it was said that he has risen. Now that same body that was taken before the Sabbath from the cross. Lord, you, you spoke of, of the crucifixion. Could yeah. you leave it that I'm sure it will, the answer will come? Thank you, John. Now I must give my question. Yeah, but we've got it from you. Now, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Now who was the one that was crucified? <laughs> there was no crucifixion. What I'm saying is, I've been proving to you for an hour and a half that it was a fiction, a crucifixion, F-I-C-T-I, and fiction had taken place and no crucifixion in the sense of a man being killed on the cross. One and a half hour I was proving that to you. Like a man was telling a story about Romeo and Julie. Whole night, Romeo and Julie. At the end of the morning, early in the morning, the guy wants to know whether Julie was a boy or a girl. Thank you. Next question, please. Could you please speak into the microphone? Yeah, we won't hear you. Hello. Uh, the Muslim Digest, uh, Mr. Dilad, I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, the Muslim Digest in August 1960, page 27. Uh, you are being quoted to say the following words. Because right now you said you never used the word Sunni in all your lectures. But here you are quoted saying this in August 1960, page 27 in the Muslim Digest. I believe that Jesus was not nailed to the cross. Since he was not taken up to the cross, the question of swimming does not arise. All right, you just want to point out he has used the word swooning. Yeah. Right, thank you. Uh, it looks like from 1960 the brother is following the Muslim Digest, wanting to find out what did that said and what he didn't do. Well, you're a Those words, this look, it's an amazing thing. You come to a lecture, you listen to the man for one and a half hour, and you haven't got a single word which you can contradict. Now, in 1960 or 69, what it was, he says, did that said that I didn't believe in the word that was used. In my lectures, I said, I never used the word swoon for the things that has happened. And I still stand by that. In my lectures. Did I say in my lectures? Right. It's an amazing thing. Next question, please. Yeah. 
I would like to make a statement and then ask one Silence. question. Silence. Silence. I would like to make a statement and ask one question. If you can just give me a couple of minutes. I've been listening tonight to the spiritual part of man. We've been walking all in the spirit and we've heard about different stations of the Muslim and the Christian. But let's, I want to get down to the natural now. We are all natural people, different colors, and I want to be in the natural. And I would just like you to give us a couple of minutes to share in the natural. There is one certainty in the natural for all color, race, creed whatsoever. I would like our brother Diva to answer me that certainty in life. You know, I was a big horse racing fan. I've uh, been a geek gambler, and they gave me a horse to, to gamble, and they gave it the certainty, excuse me, to ask him this, but the horse lost. There's one certainty in life which affects all of us sitting here, irrespective of the color, creed, race. And the biggest problem is this the certainty is death. Can you see? The biggest problem in your life today is sicknesses, is death and separation. Separated from your loved ones, irrespective of color, creed, and what? We need somebody to take this away. If it is Jesus Christ, if it is Muhammad, whoever it is, we will accept it. If Muhammadism is right, I will surely accept it tonight. Because the problem today is that people is dying. We are living in a dying world. Can you see laying down your loved ones? Brother? Yes, son. You can laugh, but you also die. We are brother? all going one way. We are all going to die. Thank you, brother. Uh, I think your point is very well made. Could we come to your question? Now we please? want to come to the question. Why did Jesus, why did Mary? Now, the question is, is Jesus, was he buried or wasn't he? Was he crucified or not? Okay, let's say he was. He, let's say, brother Jared is right, that Jesus is a fake. Let's walk along in the natural. He's a fake. Okay, he's a prophet, but he's not the son of God. Excuse me, brother. I'm speaking at the moment. Please don't intervene. Right, Jesus is dead. Now, if we do not believe that Jesus came to give us life, we will also die and we will be dead. But just say that Jesus was crucified and he is the son, the righteousness of God. And you have to stand between him one day as the mediator between God and son. Then you're going to lose out. Thank you very much. The big question I want to ask your brother Dira is this. Why did Mary take so long before she came to anoint, to use the word anointed, you know, we use the word anointed when we also in the word blessing. You use the word anointed in massaging. Why did she wait so long to massage the wounds? The wounds were already been septic by the time when she came after three days. Right. So I'll leave this decision to you. Thank you. Okay. Silence. Silence. The, the happenings, the alleged happenings about, you know, the, at Calvary, were on Friday evening, according to the Christian scriptures, Friday evening. And Friday evening is the beginning of the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath day, no Jew was supposed to be out doing any work. Therefore, she had to go away. She wasn't living there. She was living in the city, not around Calvary. So Sunday morning is the first opportunity she's got before sunrise of coming. Therefore, Sunday morning, because she's not living there. She, this person, the body, Jesus, was in the hands of his secret disciples, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They were there. All the other twelve, according to your scriptures, they all forsook him and fled. They were not there. So now she comes along after three days, uh, because she had seen, she must have seen signs of life, because she was about the only woman. That's what the Bible says, that she was sitting across from where these things were taking place. She was the only woman that is being described in Matthew and Mark, that she's watching, she's watching what's going on. So if she saw signs of life, she was not going to shout and tell the people that the guy is alive. So after three days, she comes around to give him treatment. And the word for anoint, as I said, is masaha, which means all these meaning, shades of meaning it carries. So what does she want to go on and anoint a body, if in the sense that you are thinking, a 100 pound weight of medicants around the man. So what do you want to go and anoint him with what? You tell me. What she wants to anoint, 100 pounds worth of medicants and a shroud around the man, what do you do with a person like that? What anointment? It needs now is to go and put him in a hole, bury him. But no, she's not talking about burial, she wants to anoint. So I said the only sensible thing is she wants to treat him. Next question. Last question, Last question for Last the night. Time. First of all, I would like to apologize. Um, I don't think it's fair, you know, to interrupt. But I must admit, 
certain things, you know, which were said tonight, go really in my heart and move my emotions, so that I can perhaps cry, because I feel very much hurt, because my word of God and Jesus Christ is torn actually into the dirt. Um, so sorry when I interrupted. Um, you mentioned two people during the address this evening, Joshua McDowell, with whom you had a symposium about three years ago, on the 30th of August, I believe, 81, on the same topic. And you advertised quite a few, uh, you advertised this tape. And I would like to uh, encourage the audience to get hold of this tape and to listen to the fool, uh, uh, Joshua McDowell, as you put it, to the audience this evening. To listen to the side of the fool, Joshua McDowell, who clearly explained to the people in Durban why Jesus Christ was crucified. Then I would like just at the end quote from you the verse which you recited to us in Arabic in English and that is Surah 457 58 and because of their saying we slew the Messiah Jesus of uh, Jesus son of Mary Allah's messenger they slew him not nor crucified but it appeared unto uh, so unto them the word crucified is even used in the Quran and lo those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. They have no acknowledged, no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of conjecture. Right. Sorry. They slew him not of, for certain, but Allah took him up to himself. Now, Mr. Dita, you make the statement, no one was crucified. Someone else was crucified instead of Jesus. That is Islamic teaching. And I think that is my question. Why do you actually tells people something about the Christian faith and destroy the Bible and you don't get back to your Quran. I, I would assume if I would be a Muslim, I would be utterly disappointed for this evening because I didn't get anything from this book, from this book. From this book I got something distorted, but nothing from that. Could Sorry. you please answer this? Thank you. I started with the verse which we have just finished off with. And they said in boast that they killed Christ Jesus, Isa ibn Maryam Rasulullah. Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. And they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. Brother, should be alone, but it was made to appear to them so. When did I say somebody was substituted? Did I say anything like that? Did I say somebody else was put on his place? I said, whatever you are thinking, since you say you have your authorities, witnesses, eyewitnesses and your witnesses to the happenings, I said, let us examine your witnesses. This is the most sensible legal thing that people do in any civilized country. When you make a claim, anybody makes a claim, and if there is a counterclaim, you go to court and you present your case and your witness is being cross-examined to prove whether he's speaking the truth or false. And that is actually what I did. I use your witnesses, your witnesses from your book and showed you that whatever you are imagining didn't happen. And that's my case. I close my case. Now, either you have to refute me by telling me that a spirit has flesh and bones. Jesus said the spirit has no flesh and bones. And these resurrected bodies eat broiled fish and honeycomb. Tell me. I'm prepared to listen to you. But nobody has come forward yet. You keep on talking about Josh McDowell now. You're talking about some tapes. What has that got to do with this meeting tonight? You know, it's an amazing situation. You are personally present here. Yeah? What do you want to know about Josh McDowell, his lecture, what he said and what he did? What has that got to do with this meeting? You're talking about the tape. You know, you're confusing the people. They don't know what you're talking about. You, you know, put forth your claim. What is it? What do you want? You want Josh McDowell's tape? I said, look, we don't stop them. You go and write to John Gilchrist, your partner in Benoni. He will give it to you. Why do you want it from me? What is this Josh McDowell has to got to do with your question time now nothing so it's an amazing thing you know that you're listening for one and a half hour and there is not a thing that you can challenge me on to say that i have made a misstatement and this is wrong and prove your point we thank everybody for having my come. dear brothers and sisters look here is a proof here is a proof what you have to do you master that little booklet and i tell you there isn't a christian born who can stand before you you'll find sick people you know, they say they're born again and they'll keep on you try talking to the wall. Don't talk to the wall. The ordinary people, Allah says, Minhumul Mu'minuna, there are good people among them. Talk to them, invite them for tea, talk to them, show them the Quran, reason with them, and inshallah you'll be able to do the job. The professionals, you leave them to me at meetings like these.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. The Qurans, the translations of the Quran, are still available outside in the foyer.